Welcome to Ash Wednesday Worship at Faith Lutheran Church. We trust that wherever and whenever we gather, God gathers us into the one body of Christ. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathed into dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. Call forth our prayers and acts of kindness and strengthen us to face our mortality with confidence in the mercy of your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Psalms. Please read the whole print. Have mercy on me, O God, According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. 
If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Our second reading for today comes from the prophet Joel. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, Call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged. Gather the children, even infants, at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room, and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why would it be said among the peoples, where is their God? The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Return to the The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward." But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. One evening, we kids were playing in the granary when the sky started to get cloudy. The clouds were very dark and appeared to be solid and rolling on the ground as they approached us from the southwest. Mother called Sis to come to the house and sent Willis and I to the wood pile to get the wood before the storm struck. 
The wood pile was about 50 yards from the kitchen door, and by the time we got our arms full of wood, the clouds had completely blocked out the sun, and it was very dark and eerie. As we started to the house, a few drops of muddy rain fell, and then the dust and the wind reached us. Before we got to the house, the air was so full of dust, we couldn't open our eyes and we could hardly breathe. Mother wet cloths and tied them over nose and mouth as the dust was so thick, even in the house, that you could not breathe. The storm lasted all night, and when we got up the next morning, there was about an inch of fine red dust on everything in the house. What I just read is a a vivid excerpt from Memories of a Kansas Farm Boy, a recollection of Winton Sipe of the 1930s Dust Bowl. It's a powerful and vivid passage, especially on the evening before a predicted blizzard. I mean, can you imagine looking to the southwest and seeing a cloud that appeared to be solid moving towards you with breakneck speed? Can you imagine the terror of knowing what was coming? Air so full of dust, you can't open your eyes and you can hardly breathe. Imagine seeing this and wondering where your next meal would come from, knowing that as long as the soil kept blowing and the the rains kept from falling, Nothing was going to grow. No money was going to come in. Standing before those clouds, that had to be humbling, right? Absolutely humbling. And what can you do when a dust storm is bearing down on you? You'd feel powerless, confronted with the, the raw power of the dust and wind. What was coming was just inevitable. It was going to happen. It was happening, and and it was not going to be good. It was going to be bad. You know, it's exactly this kind of inevitable terror that informs the biblical book of Joel. For Joel, it was this inevitable experience of a locust plague rather than a dust storm that sets up his prophecy. But the way Joel describes would work for either Let the inhabitants of of the land tremble, he writes, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from old, nor will be again after the ages to come. You see, like the Dust Bowl, Joel's locust plague was was an agricultural crisis. The locusts destroyed all the crops. They were just gone. And more to the point, This plague would have confronted all with the experience of their mortality. It would have confronted them with all their frailty, their their weakness, and their powerlessness in the face of the force of God's creation. It would have invited Joel's community to ask God with the words of Job, will you turn me to dust again? You see, there's this deep sense of urgency or inevitability in Joel, a sense that If the severity of the plague continues, it'll mean catastrophe. And for all intents and purposes, it will be the end of the world for Joel and the community to whom he writes. You know, many of us have our own stories about these kinds of events. My earliest memory is from June 3rd, 1980. The night Grand Island, Nebraska was hit by a storm unlike any other seen before on the Great Plains of North America. The disaster that night wiped out a whole section of the city's southern business district and hundreds of homes. Of course, I remember safely watching the green swirling sky from my porch in Hastings, Nebraska, grateful that the storm wasn't coming our direction. But that's just it. Joel doesn't see these storms from afar. Instead, he envisions a storm that is coming our direction. Joel envisions the great and terrible day of the Lord sweeping down toward us like locusts covering the hillside, like solid dust, like an army swarming to devour its foe. Its direction set, its momentum unmistakable, its arrival inevitable. You see, Joel recasts this locust plague as an experience of universal terror, a terror where all would be confronted with the humbling power of God, a terror that would expose the frailty, weakness, and powerlessness of us all. It's inevitable. 
And we know it is precisely in those moments where we're totally and terrifyingly out of control. Those moments in our lives where the outcome seems inevitable. That we're reminded potently that we cannot get out of life alive. We are reminded of how not in control we actually are. But despite what seems totally inevitable, Joel cries out, sound the alarm. Like one spitting into a hurricane, Joel calls the community to resistance, even as feeble and puny as that resistance might seem in relationship to the catastrophe sweeping down the mountain. And interestingly, Joel doesn't sound a charge as if running out and confronting the crisis head on will do any good. No, Joel takes for granted that the community cannot stand before this great and terrible day. This is no underdog story. This is no story of struggle against impossible odds. No, this is a struggle of a community knowing their beat, knowing their mortality, and sounding the retreat. Joel's alarm is a retreat. A retreat into the only one who can redeem from the terror of admitting how weak and frail and out of control we really are. Joel sounds a retreat from every myth of being self-made, from every lie that we can make ourselves secure, from every deception that we can somehow defeat death. You see, Joel sounds a retreat, invites us to retreat, to repent, to literally turn from the fiction that we can overcome the inevitability of death and to turn to God instead. In light of this inevitable coming disaster, Joel gives us two words that make all the difference. Even now, he says. Even now. You see, Joel reminds us that what seems inevitable for us is not inevitable for God. When God is involved, there is more to the story. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God. You see, even now in 20th century America and in all the years to come, even now in the midst of our violent, unjust, unbelieving, indifferent society, even now in our situation, marked as we are with disdain for our neighbor's needs, the neglect of the will of God, even now in the midst of our fears, our sufferings, our guilts, and our ignorance. The God of all mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, holds out to us the opportunity for repentance and return that all may stand and know the salvation of the day of the Lord. Even now, right now, right here, we have the assurance that repentance that this return to God is possible, not because of what we can do, but because of what God is doing. We have the assurance, the confident hope that repentant new life will be wrought in us by the power of God's Holy Spirit poured into our hearts, a spirit about which Joel prophesies. Even now, our brokenness, our sinful nature, our pride that we can do this all on our own, our attempts to prop up other things in God's place, all this is being put to death in Christ, brought crashing down to dust and ashes, to nothingness, so that we might be redeemed. So that as Paul put it, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Even now, God is drawing us into repentance, rending our hearts, bidding us to return to God. And you know, Oddly, somehow this return to dust, this return to humility, to fasting and weeping and mourning, this retreat into God's mercy, this is exactly what it means to return to God after all. You see, once we get to the conclusion that we're dust, we are reminded that we live only by the fact that the creator breathed God's spirit into, into dust and gave us life. That's it. And then we see we see in the death of Jesus our own deaths, the inevitable catastrophe, and we remember again that we are dust. Our life, our redemption, our hope, they rely completely on God and nothing else. So you know, Lent, for all its hype, for its uh, fish eating and, and questions about what to give up, is not really about doing more 
or doing less. It's not really about doing at all. Lent is a season of coming into touch with our own sinfulness, need of redemption and mortal condition, a time to really learn, to live into what it means to be dust and ashes. See, if Lent begs anything of us, it's this, that confronted with the inevitable storms of life, that we be honest with ourselves, that we step back for a moment and take account that in recognizing that we are not as self-reliant as we imagine, we might learn to trust God all over again. Even now. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. God is my shepherd, so nothing shall I want. I rest in the meadows of faithfulness and love. I walk by the quiet waters of peace. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Gently you raise me and heal my weary soul. You lead me by pathways of righteousness and truth. My spirit shall sing the music of your name. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Though I should wander the valley of death, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. Your rod and your staff, my comfort and my hope. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into of hatred, crowning me with love beyond my power to hold. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into kindness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of my God forevermore. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into Friends in Christ, today with the whole church, we enter the time of remembering Jesus' Passover from death to life, and our life in Christ is renewed. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for God's mercy. We are created to experience joy in communion with God, to love one another, and to live in harmony with creation. But our sinful rebellion separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, so that we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended. 
As disciples of Jesus, we are called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to the discipline of Lent, self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting, sacrificial giving and works of love, strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. Let us continue our journey through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned by our fault, by our own fault, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O oh God. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that have infected our lives we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Our neglect of human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors, and our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. On Ash Wednesday, we remember our mortality and our deep need of God's grace. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. O oh Lord our God, 
You gather your church and call us to return to you. Accompany us throughout our Lenten pilgrimage. Create in us clean hearts and renew all the baptized to declare your praise. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Renew your creation, O God. Bring rains to parched places and heal lands affected by a changing climate that all inhabitants of the earth experience your abundance. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Renew your people, O God. Respond to those who cry out to you in secret or in seclusion. Equip us with compassion to care for those who experience homelessness, food insecurity, economic hardship, and illness. Especially Jan Gothman, Linda Stanton, Dave Neubauer, Susan Peck, Jane Shaw, Joyce Bruner, Connie Marney, Alan Koosman, Carolyn Bielen, Gary Ingstrom, Joan Peterson, Joan Butler, Don Dorer, Frank Pernat, and Rick Jorgensen. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Renew this congregation, O God. Inspire our faith formation ministries and those who teach and lead. Invigorate us with lifelong curiosity and wonder as we grow as your disciples. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hear the benediction. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Amen. Life-giving stream.
last and I found in him my star, my sun, and in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.